Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm introducing myself today. Um, the usual introducer uh, couldn't make it, and I promised to bring someone, and I forgot, so I brought myself <laughs> along. Um, <clears throat> that's the way it goes in term time, I guess. Anyway, I'm Roger O'Keefe. I'm the professor of public international law. Public international law is a big field. In the old days, it covered basically two things, war and fish. Uh, these days, as you'll learn, it covers a whole lot more. And I'll be talking about the protection of what we call cultural property or cultural heritage, uh, specifically tangible cultural heritage uh, under international law, specifically in the context of wartime and uh, the various ways in which this can be enforced, some of the weaknesses uh, and what we might do about it. Um, now, it's the constitutional role of a mother to undermine the confidence of their children um, with things like ringing them from the other side of the planet. Have you picked up your socks? You know, have you ever stopped to wonder why you're still unmarried? Have you picked up your socks? There seems to be cause and effect in her mind. <clears throat> well, I wrote a book which came out of my PhD on the protection of cultural heritage and armed conflict. And the first thing my mother said is, why are you bothering to do that? Um, now, her family hails from uh, the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, and we were in Dubrovnik six months uh, before the war broke out, and I have a photo photograph of my mother outside the bastion of St. John, uh, as it's called, the thickest part of the walls of Dubrovnik. And six months later, a um, heat-seeking surface-to-surface missile slammed into that. Well, luckily, the Ragusans um, were prepared for Ottoman onslaught, Venetian onslaught. Those things are 18 feet thick, and so the missile just blew up. But that's how I got interested in the thing. And my mother's idea was, well, you know, look what happened in Yugoslavia, a fat lot of good that law was. And she may say the same thing today. And you'll notice that there are no pictures. Um, two reasons for that. I'm te technologically um, completely maladroit. And <clears throat> second of all, it would be far too depressing to show you the pictures. Okay? You've seen them, I'm sure. In Syria, we have had the systematic destruction of Palmyra, um, a bit of a place called Bosra. In Iraq, we've had uh, Nimrod, Nineveh, Hatra, etc. Um, Yemen, for those of you who haven't been keeping track, it's a less uh, well-known story, but it seems that the Saudis have been none too careful in their airstrikes in certain areas, a little bit in the old city of um, Sana'a, but more in the centre of the country and some of the historic cities. On the other hand, of course, too, I'm sure you're well aware, there's uh, been a lot of it in the newspapers, how much of it is actually going on is a contested question, but there's no doubt that there is a lot going on of pillage, loosely so-called, of cultural heritage. That is the um, uh, illicit digging up of archaeological things, the breaking into museums and so on and so forth, smuggling and um, uh, in many cases selling them on the market. So it's a depressing story. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is that, in fact, there's a hell of a lot of international law which seeks to regulate this. And the take-home message, contrary to popular imagination, is that the law is doing as much as law can realistically be expected to do. Okay? Murder happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But do you hear people saying, that bleeding law of murder, it's bollocks, isn't it? It don't work. They don't, but for some reason with international law, they say, oh, international law is a load of garbage, no one pays any attention to it. Actually, the vast majority of states and non-state actors in the vast majority of situations do, but no law, international or otherwise, can prevent a, an ideologically or ethically perverse person or group from doing what they want to do, okay? Unless you're going to have a policeman, or in the international case, an army stationed next to every individual and armed group, okay? Law can only do so much. The answer in a lot of our cases lies outside the law, which isn't to say that the law is useless, but that it does its bit, but there are other bits that can be done. 
What I will also seek to show you is that in fact law has been useful, in some cases if only to punish, even if not to prevent, and you may be surprised by um, some of the historical examples that I'll give. At the end of it, I'll open it up and uh, ask you for questions. Okay, so there's a lot of bodies of international law in this area. The chief body is what used to be called the laws of war, what we now call the laws of armed conflict. There are generally applicable rules, but believe it or not, there are three purpose dedicated treaties, conventions, okay, on the protection of armed of cultural property in armed conflict. Supplementing this is what we call international criminal law, that is those aspects first of the laws of war which give rise to the criminal responsibility of individuals for their breach, what we call war crimes, but other crimes like crimes against humanity and even some crimes to do with transnational organised crime and the financing of terrorism which are being used these days to suppress the illicit traffic in cultural property. The next area, uh, a treaty or two and a little bit of work from the UN Security Council, directly focusing on the illicit traffic, whether in armed conflict or otherwise. And the final thing I'll focus on is one or two additional measures taken by the Security <coughs> Council. I'll then look at how that's been enforced and whether it's been useful or not. Okay, so to cut a very long story short, over the centuries, a body of international law has developed in the field of the laws of armed conflict or the laws of war to protect cultural property both from destruction and damage on the one hand and from its misappropriation, putting it simply its plunder or pillage, its theft, uh, on the other hand. Okay? So protection of the actual fabric and its um, scientific integrity, one might say, of an archaeological site and then protection of movables um, to stop them being stolen and trafficked. Um, these arose over the centuries. Some of them are what we call customary international law, which is a sort of spontaneously arising law coming about simply because states think that that's what the law is and act accordingly. But also much of it in specific agreements concluded that we familiarly call treaties. And uh, the cardinal rules in this area are pretty straightforward and simple, even if there's a lot of complication overlaid on the top of them. It is unlawful in both international armed conflict and what we call non-international armed conflict or civil wars, putting it very simply, to destroy cultural property for no military reason. So, the first thing to say is that everything that ISIS has done in that regard is flatly internationally unlawful, the systematic mowing down of cultural property. Okay? There has to be, ultimately, a military necessity to target cultural property. In the modern language of the war, we say that that property has to have become a military objective. And in such cases, then, as unfortunate as it may be, there may in fact, be legal justification for targeting cultural property. And the chief, and these days realistically only way in which that will come about, is if the enemy is using it for military purposes. And sadly, that has been the source of much destruction in the war in Syria. It's popularly known what ISIS has been doing, but less well known is that all sides to the conflict, there isn't both sides, all sides to the conflict, have taken up military positions in ancient um, historic sites. Why would that be? Well, the Crac de Chevalier, the great crusader castle on the top of a tabletop mountain thing in Syria, is a fortress. And so, People have been using it for its original purpose and therefore drawing fire on it. In other cases, we're talking about street-to-street -street fighting in the ancient souks of Aleppo and various places like that. Now, a lot of the destruction has been unnecessary in that regard, but nonetheless, there has been some that which, according to the laws of war, one would have to conclude, as tragic as it is, has not been unlawful destruction. But the bottom line remains, you can't target it 
unless it has become a military objective, which in very simple terms means that there is an imperative military need to do so. Now, in a vast majority of cases, there won't necessarily be an imperative military need, even if the enemy is using it, even if the enemy is using it. So a famous case from the early 2000s, uh, as one of the numerous intifadas that seem to um, crop up in the occupied Palestinian territory, um, occup uh, armed Palestinian militants took up a position in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. But the Israel, Israel Defense Forces said, well, look, they're in there. They're not coming out. They surrounded it with a ring of steel, tanks, etc., etc., etc. And they said, well, there's absolutely no need to do anything. We just wait. And then what they did is they put in place good officers and interlocutors. In fact, the, the Roman Catholic Church got involved and, uh, and in the end managed to resolve the situation. In many cases, too, in 2003, the invasion of Iraq and so on and so forth, when snipers took up positions in minarets or ziggurats, I love that term. I hadn't heard that term since, you know, 1981 when I was in year seven at school, ziggurat, you know, or shaduf, an ancient water drawing instrument. I just threw that one in, no one took up a position in a shaduf, I just like the word. Um, uh, they just bypassed it, okay? <laughs> Let them stay up there, they, they'll, you know, they'll come down at some point. There is also a rule which is called the rule of proportionality. It may well be that you're not intending to target the cultural property, but that there's a military objective nearby. Well, what the modern laws of war says, if you cannot hit the military objective without causing disproportionate damage to the cultural property, then you may not target the military objective. Now, disproportionate according to what? Well, in some ways, it's apples and pears. What you're weighing is the military need to hit the target against the risk and damage that would be done to the cultural property. And the calculus will work out different ways. So in the first um, Iraq war in 1991, Saddam Hussein parked a whole lot of fighter jets next to the great ziggurat at Ur. They weren't on a runway, okay? They didn't have any fuel around them or whatever. And the Americans said, well, look, they're not going anywhere. We don't need to target them and the risk to one of the greatest pieces of cultural um, heritage in the world is too great, and so they didn't target it. Okay. Um, now, the flip side of that obligation is the obligation not to use cultural property for military purposes. And again, sadly, we've seen too much of that in recent wars. Um, fighters taking up positions, as I said, in the cultural property. Well, they are flatly prohibited from doing so. But the obligation in that regard goes beyond using it in a fashion which might draw fire on it. It's also using it in a fashion which will simply damage it through its use. And so you cannot build a military base mm -hmm, on Babylon, as happened. Now, a lot's been made of the building of a base at Babylon. I mean, it was not a deliberate, spiteful Act. There happens to be a bit of a plane around Babylon and whatever. But the fact of the matter is, if you start digging a latrine around Babylon, okay, you're going through 14 strata of archaeological evidence. If you're filling a sandbag anywhere near Babylon, okay, you're filling it with God knows how many millennia of stuff. Okay, so there is a prohibition on the use of cultural heritage in any way, which would uh, damage it in that fashion. So that's protection of cultural property in terms of its fabric. There are two crucial obligations in terms of its theft. One is that the parties themselves must not steal it. Okay? They must not engage in systematic plunder, nor must they um, uh, exercise so little discipline over their troops as to allow them to pillage it at the individual level, okay? So they themselves can't be responsible for it. But crucially, and perhaps even more importantly, they have an obligation positively to prevent others, third parties, from pillaging cultural property. Now this presupposes that they don't do what ISIS is apparently doing, which is actually licensing and taxing the digging up of cultural heritage by local people and, and selling. So they're the key obligations under the laws of war. Now, 
bolstering those are obligations under other treaties, uh, which impose on third states, okay, obligations to prevent the illicit import and traffic of cultural property. Now, there is a particular treaty on this of 1970. Equally, certain provisions, as I alluded to earlier, of more general treaties about organised crime and about the financing of terrorism are being used in this regard. And it's the terrorism angle that is now uh, gaining a lot of traction. The United Nations Security Council is particularly exercised by this. And so, uh, earlier this year, in a resolution which echoes one adopted in 2003, it made it mandatory for every member state of the United Nations, which is basically every state in the world by the Vatican City, um, to regulate the market in cultural heritage coming out of Iraq and Syria, which putting it extremely simply means basically not allowing um, traffic in those things. Um, so going beyond the existing treaties, the Security Council has imposed mandatory measures in that regard. Um, and so that's choking off the demand, okay, working at both ends. Okay, well, has any of this stuff ever been enforced? The answer is yes. Well, how has it been enforced? In a range of ways. So after the First World War and after the Second World War, the defeated powers were made to hand back, insofar as they still had it, cultural property that they had plundered. Well, of course, in the German case, it was somewhat more difficult in that the Russians had helped themselves to that cultural property as what they called war reparations, a point I won't go into, but I'm happy to talk about later. But insofar as they still had it, they were legally obliged under treaties concluded at the end of the First and Second World War to give back cultural property. There are also one or two other interesting provisions. In 1914, German troops burnt down the city of Leuven or Louvain, including its great medieval library with the greatest collection of manuscripts in Canabula and various things uh, of um, medieval and early modern Europe. And at the end of the First World War, Germany was made to give back corresponding items from its own collections. Okay, we wouldn't do that this, these days, but it was made to hand over equivalent things. It's copy of a Gutenberg Bible. It's copy of this, that, and the other. Okay, that's extreme. As I said, that would be out of favour today, but nonetheless, it happened. The other way it can happen is in a normal state-to-state -state claim at the international level. Eritrea and Ethiopia had a small but horrible war, which bankrupted both countries, in the course of which Ethiopian troops blew up a 2,500-year-old stela, which is like an obelisk. Okay, they were held responsible for it by the relevant um, international tribunal and were ordered to pay reparation to help repair the thing. Okay? Similarly, a collection taken by Iraqi troops during the invasion of Kuwait uh, was the subject of a reparations order. More interestingly, and... Um, something with a bit more bite, perhaps, but equally necessarily ex post facto, there has been a lot of war crimes trials for destruction of cultural property. Now, you may not know, but three of the German high command in the Nuremberg trial were held responsible inter alia for their role in the massive destruction and plunder of the cultural property, in particular of the Soviet Union. The main person in this regard, Alfred Rosenberg, who was in charge of a particular unit whose sole job was to plunder the cultural property of the occupied territories, chiefly in the east, far less so in the west, um, and to take it back to Berlin. Equally, Ribbentrop and Bormann had their own units. They had their own units for their own personal collection. And so you had very strange situations, as once happened in a villa outside Ancona, where the main SS guys arrived to steal it on behalf of the Reich, and Ribbentrop's guys were there stealing it on behalf of Ribbentrop, and Goering's guys were there stealing it on behalf of Goering, and they had a sort of demarcation dispute. You know, <laughs> who has first dibs at the... Um, 
original codex of Tacitus's Germania, okay? Um, a fairly absurd thing, but I'm sure, you know, Monty Python or something could make someone something of it. Um, now, in more recent times, uh, the two main people in charge of the bombardment of the old town of Dubrovnik, a man called Jokic, a man called Strugar, were both convicted, in fact one of them pleaded guilty, by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and sent to jail for a long time for their bombardment of a world heritage site. Equally, about eight people um, responsible for the devastation of old Ottoman mosques across Bosnia and the plunder of cultural property from mektebs and madrasas and equally from Catholic churches uh, were convicted. And most recently, a man called Prlic and his gang, who were Bosnian Croats, were convicted for the destruction of the ancient bridge at Mostar, from which the town takes its name, Most, meaning bridge. Um, Prlic is a good example of a phenomenon that you see in that uh, region. In my grandfather's town, they make a wine called Grk. There's an island called Krk. Uh, the, the city of Trieste is pronounced Trust. I've always wanted to write a spoof of Death in Venice called Death in Trieste. Mrt Trust. Um, they say that wars are created by lack of a scarcity of natural resources. I think that was vowels in the former Yugoslavia. If they'd given the Serbs an A and the Croatians an E and the Bosnians an I, everyone would have been happy. Anyway, so these guys were put behind bars. And then as we speak, one of the people chiefly responsible for the destruction of the ancient Sufi mausolea in Timbuktu in the non-international armed conflict in Mali a few years ago is waiting to stand trial at the International Criminal Court. Okay, um, he was picked up in Niger and handed over to the court. And for the first time, the sole charges against him relate to cultural property. And the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has decided that one of the themes that the court is pursuing at the moment is the protection of cultural property. No. Re no prizes for guessing why. She has said that already the court would have jurisdiction over some of the re people responsible for um, ISIS's destruction, but they would only be the small fry, and at, uh, at the moment they are more interested in getting the head people over whom at, at present they don't have jurisdiction. So war crimes trials have been um, very useful in that regard. Um, I also mentioned the United Nations Security Council. Well, it's got in on the act. And when it gets involved, okay, and uses the full extent of its powers, um, uh, then things can start to happen. So as I said, it's imposed these obligations on states around the world to cut off the illicit traffic of cultural heritage. And now for the first time, in connection with other reporting obligations they have, states must report to the council, to a committee, on measures taken in this regard. Just like they have to report on measures taken in relation to choking off other sources of financing of terrorism and so on and so forth. In other words, sanctions, okay, will bite. Um, and it's the Security Council's involvement, starting in 2003, which um, in some ways, I don't you know, want to embrace this too much, but in some ways has been a game changer. Before then, the only major market state that was party to the relevant treaty on the illicit traffic of cultural property was the United States of America. And it was very upset that Germany, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and many other states with flourishing art markets had not signed up to it. And it was pressuring them to do so. Well, they had no choice but to take measures against the illicit traffic coming out of Iraq when in 2003 the Security Council got involved. Well, measures were taken at the national level. The art market got more or less used to it. Of course, some of it went underground, etc., etc., etc. But the supposedly more respectable players in this regard realised that you know, the sky wasn't going to come crashing down. And so states then felt freer to adopt legislation to regulate their own 
art markets. And that has now been beefed up through the Security Council and subsequently through um, mandatory measures taken by European Union organs in that regard. The final and very interesting um, development was again in relation to Mali. For the very first time, the United Nations Security Council authorised a military force to use military force to protect cultural property. Okay, now this was in a very specific context. The people who had been responsible for the destruction of the mausolea in Timbuktu had been forced out of the area. The Malian government, with the support of uh, African and French troops, had re-established order over the area. And the United Nations was placing an administration to help with the um, rebuilding in the area. And in this very specific context, it mandated the military forces, okay, to fire their weapons at people, that is, the rebels, etc., etc., who might come back and attempt to destroy the cultural property. Now, some people have said, well, why don't we have more of this? Drop them into hot spots, okay? Well, that's undesirable for a, a range of reasons, but nonetheless, in this quite specific, what you loosely might call peacekeeping context, okay, it is a step forward, and there is talk of more of this sort of thing happening. Equally, a whole range of organisations uh, are really stepping up their activities in this regard. Obviously, UNESCO, the United Nations Specialised Agency with the Mandate for Culture, and it's been very helpful in this regard that the UNESCO Director General has been running a none too subtle campaign to become Secretary General of the United Nations, so she's really taken it out there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, perhaps, a bit too much so, because the boy who cried wolf, if you say it enough, people just switch off. But she's been very active in building alliances, um, interinstitutional and amongst states, to bring this issue to the fore. Um, I myself have been involved in um, uh, something with UNESCO. Uh, I am tangentially involved in something with NATO. Uh, I am also involved in a UNESCO-sponsored project for a military handbook guiding forces if they go into these culturally rich areas on what to do, what to avoid, etc., etc. Interpol has long been involved in this area and the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime is now very big in this area and the connection with organised crime and terrorism has, although it has its risks, um, led to uh, mobilisation in this area. So lots has been done. But obviously destruction still goes on. Destruction still goes on. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Ultimately, the law can do only so much. So what might be done? Well, things like getting the cultural property the hell out of there to begin with. Okay, And indeed, under the relevant convention, there is an obligation to take preparatory measures, okay, so that when armed conflict comes, you can either protect the cultural property in situ through structural support, etc., 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 or if we're talking about movable cultural property, and in every circumstance it's not necessarily desirable, but spiriting the property out of there, okay? So a lot of the stuff in Iraq and Syria, thankfully, had gone to the capital, or is being stored in Japan at the moment, or Switzerland has revived its old refuges from the Second World War to receive cultural property from abroad. The United States is in the process of adopting legislation for the very same thing as is France. So at the very least, attempting physically to save movable property by getting it out of there. Sadly, also, some of the things that can be done involve simply picking up the pieces. And one of um, the big developments in the United Kingdom now is that the government has launched a cultural protection fund. And one of the things in this is helping fund a project of the um, British Museum to train Syrian uh, archaeologists and heritage people 
um, to go in immediately after an area has been liberated okay, and do what they can to gather the shards, the remnants and whatever because I'm told that remarkable things can be done over a long period of time but nonetheless remarkable things can be done in terms of restoration um, although it'd want to be remarkable wouldn't it given some of the pictures that we've seen. So engaged professionals, engaged individuals okay, taking action um, of their own accord uh, individual governments taking action in this regard. And the one thing we can all do outside the theatre of conflict, okay, is capacity building, both in our own countries and abroad. So you see a lot of lending of expertise, but equally beefing up of national enforcement mechanisms. The Metropolitan Police have only two and a half people purpose dedicated to the traffic in cultural property. Now this isn't to say that any old policeman can't arrest someone dealing in this stuff, of course they can, okay, but in terms of the expertise needed to track it, okay, um, not many people. So beefing up those sorts of things. And professional networks, um, the police freely say, we're not art historians, we're not antiquarians, we don't know whether this stuff is stolen or not. So these alliances are being built, these practical things are being done, and it's largely at that level that I think we can take things forward, because there is as much law as we need. It's doing realistically as much as it can do, but quite clearly it can only do that much. And we have to have imagination, we have to have inspiration and to try um, skin the cat another way. Uh, one of my um, favourite things in this regard, there is a group called Geneva Way, which goes and talks to non-state armed groups to try help them and convince them not to attack cultural property. And what they emphasise is that ISIS and the situation we're seeing now is not the norm. Very often in civil wars, etc., people are fighting for their identity and their culture. And the very last thing they want to do is to destroy the cultural property. So some of them are keenly interested in protecting this stuff, okay? Uh, and the existence of a gang of psychopaths in the same way that the fact that a psychopath murders someone in the street here shouldn't lead us to believe that nothing can be done. It can be, um, and we can help to improve it. So I will leave it at that. Uh, and I will open the floor to questions. Apparently there are hand mics around, so you can all join me in the chorus of funiculi funicular or something like that. Um, so please, questions. Or not. Um, you haven't mentioned anything about the Elgin marbles. Mm -hmm. uh, do you stand on that? Because that's a wholly separate issue. That's why I haven't mentioned or it. Is there anything that the law relates to on that? No, there, nothing in what I'm talking about in any way relates to that because it was not taken during armed conflict. Um, I can speak about it if you want, but it's got nothing to do with it. Um, what I'm talking about here is, is, is plunder. Uh, in, in armed conflict under the modern law. I mean, the simple answer of the Elgin Marbles is um, international law did not prohibit that at the time, nor did national law. In fact, the lawful sovereign of the territory okay, sold the marbles or gave them over, and it was perfectly lawful at the time, and international law applies what is called the rule of intertemporal law. You apply the law that, uh, that prevailed at the time. So the sad and simple story is that under international law and under domestic law, the Elgin marbles are here, okay? Now, they're here to stay legally, but whether, of course, there are other resolutions to what politically, ethically, and whatever might be a far more complicated situation is, is, is not for me to say, but the international legal complexion is perfectly clear. Thank you for the uh, talk, Professor. Sure. Um, if we can agree that the reason why we protect cultural property in times of conflict is to protect the heritage and the values they represent, um, 
but you've also mentioned that we have to balance that against military objectives. Do we then risk dehumanizing war and conflict if what we're balancing against protecting heritage and values and therefore cultural property, we're balancing that against military objectives and the barbarous acts that they may commit if they're left alone, etc. Well, we're not talking about barbarous acts. Um, we're talking about military acts which secure the military goal. But you've put your finger on something, and that is the inherent tension in the laws of war. Whether we're balancing um, the fact that you have a civilian household here, or whether you have uh, an ancient site here and whatever. As I said, we're, we're comparing apples and pears, two different things, and this is a long-running debate in the laws of armed conflict, and unfortunately, that's the way the laws are. We do have to measure immeasurables. Now, there are ways of reconciling that. Of course, we talk about military advantage and whatever, but of course, behind that, what you have to keep in mind is that there may be perfectly noble and humane goals, etc. People don't, by and large, fight things for nothing, okay? Um, but you have hit your finger on it. I mean, uh, and it is an unfortunate and difficult calculus, but unfortunately we're stuck with it because the other option is simply to prohibit everything and then to have the military completely ignore it. So over the years, um, uh, states have had to concede a bit and reconcile these things with, um, in some ways, unpleasant reality, but in some ways, perfectly justifiable reality. If the question is, will this help us defeat the Nazis or something like that, okay, then the moral calculus becomes slightly less um, unpalatable and you can actually see what's behind the military objective. But yeah, you've put your finger on what is a central debate, people versus military advantage, history versus military advantage, yep. Thank you. Sorry, <clears throat> earlier you were talking about Russia and the Nazis and the pillaging of kind of cultural heritage and stuff. I just wondered if you could expand on a bit. Were the um, Nazis pillaging Russian artifacts and then the Russians took them back or was it kind of... It's a combination of things. So um, the... Uh, Nazi forces or the German forces when they went into Russia took a hell of a lot of stuff out, although a lot of the stuff was secured. The heroic um, staff of the uh, Hermitage and various places had got a lot of it out to the Urals and, and, and hidden it, but nonetheless they took stuff. But of course a lot of the stuff had been taken elsewhere and of course much of it came from private Jewish collections um, in the West. Now by and large the Germans did not plunder the public galleries of France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy. Some stuff went, but by and large they didn't do it. But of course they took a hell of a lot um, from uh, Jewish families, whether they be collectors or, or not. Anyway, so the stuff there was a mix of things. But what the Russians, ha what happened at the end of the war is that a lot of this was stored in Berlin and thereabouts. The Soviet Union came in. They actually set up what were called trophy art units and took all the stuff back, as well as taking the, the contents of the Pergamon Museum and a whole range of things back. And what they say is that it's war reparations. You trashed our country, and in particular, you trashed our cultural heritage, um, and this is just compensation. Well, it's a very complicated issue in international law, but the very bottom line is two wrongs don't make a right. Um, and actually what they've got there is a whole lot of stuff that actually belongs to third parties. It belongs to third parties. Now, uh, the Soviet Union was very careful about revealing the whereabouts of this and whatever, but, and there was in fact a treaty of 1996 between Germany and the Russian Federation, which envisaged the handing back. But one or two years later, nationalist nationalists um, held the balance of power in the Duma, and then Putin came to power, and they brought in a, 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 an act which nationalized all of the property, therefore making it unlawful to hand it back. So the simple answer to your question is, okay, some of it, they were getting back what was theirs, but a hell of a lot of it was simply German stuff or stuff taken from elsewhere. Um, some of it was given back to the former East Germany, and that's why a lot of the museums in Berlin have their contents back. 
okay, because um, whoever it was, Brezhnev gave it back to Eric Honecker. We've all seen the full mouth kiss, so it was probably good enough. Uh, if it was good enough to kiss him, it was good enough to give back the contents of Schliemann's um, suitcases. Um, but yeah, it's a huge thorn in the side of Russian-German relations. That's it. That, sadly, apparently, is it. But I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. Um, so time is up, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>